What would Jesus do? He would take his Bible to church. <laughs> some of y'all have done your homework this week, and I'm real proud of you. And some of you were chicken, and you didn't do it or report to me on these three big words. Propitiation, efficacious, and hupokramos, which is, is a Greek word. And I want you to leave here today saying, boy, we learned something at church today. By the way, I'm glad to have Alan here. Uh, he's not quite ready to get out and play the guitar. I appreciate Layla filling in and doing so well today. But it's good to have him, and he's doing well with his recuperation. Our theme verse is 1 Peter 2.21. I hope you'll read it with me. You have it on your card. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. I remember living in the areas where it would snow, and we would be out playing in the snow with the kids, of course. I had to get out and play in the snow. And uh, the kids would try to walk in my footsteps. But my footsteps were wider and further apart. They couldn't quite reach that. So I would have to slow down just a little bit so they could step in my footsteps. Or if you've ever been at the beach and somebody would be walking on the beach and you would try to mimic their footsteps. Or possibly you were walking through some real deep grass and you decided there might be a black snake in there, so I'll walk in the steps of the person that was before me. That's what Jesus wants us to do. Last week we had a, a, a very special guest that came down here, and he gave you the pretty much the monologue of what the man in the book said when he went to the church and he said, I, I'm a little confused. You all talk about walking in the steps of Jesus, but you're living in luxury, and I've been here for three days and nobody even cared to help me get a job. We've also reviewed chapters 1 and 2. And I challenge you to read these chapters, but next week we're going to get into a little more difficult passage with chapter 3. Remember, this was a fisherman. Peter, the rough and tough fisherman. But he was a Jew that had been trained in the synagogue. He knew the Old Testament. He wasn't the... I wouldn't say he was the scholar that Paul was, but still, for Peter to write this message in the book, in the, the language of Greek to those people that would, of course, understand that. He not only had to be inspired, but he had to be educated. You see, God uses whatever we're going through for the next step in our life. This morning, Dr. Stanley talked about that, about God showing you the path. Folks, if we knew last year in May what we were going to have to go through for the last year, for the next 365 days, it would have scared us. You would have said, there's no way I can go through that. There's no way that that uh, Betty here would have known what she had to face with her family and her children. Hey, Pete, Pete and Cookie, what you've been through. And then Pete and Cookie's great-grandchildren losing their home this week up in Amelia. If you happen to have brought things for those children... Please leave them in the sanctuary, or if you're going to make a donation, just write on there for the Hibbard children or the Gordon children. We'll understand. But God guides us one step at a time. And then we've seen the prerequisites of what it takes to be a servant of God. Folks, it's just not as easy as saying, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I believe. I'm saved. Now I'm ready. I'm going to heaven. There's prerequisites, and we, we uh, looked at that for two weeks in chapters 1 and 2. John MacArthur said, this word example means a model to imitate. Some of us have made model cars. 
model airplanes. You've modeled with clay. And you tried to make something that looked similar to the original. John MacArthur stated, We are called to salvation. And then we're called to patient endurance. Let me say that again. Patient endurance. 2 Corinthians 4, For our light affliction, which is for but a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The word example in this verse literally means under writing. Hupo under gramos writing. Now, Alan, when you were in the insurance business, you were known, I think, as an underwriter. A person who wrote with the uh, superior company over you, with them showing you what to do, how to do it. You were the underwriter. As a pastor, I'm called the under-shepherd. Jesus Christ being our great shepherd and the, the pastor of the church being the under-shepherd. The word literally means underwriting, a copy for imitation. Hupo gramos. Now most of us don't go around speaking in Greek unless we're ordering a, a, a gyro or unless we're uh, asking for some feta cheese on our Greek salad. But this is a great word because it's the only time it's used in the whole New Testament. So this was not a word that was common. Peter took these two thoughts, the under and the writing. It reminds me of the days we used to buy a coloring book that had tracing pages. Or we would possibly, as we were typing a letter on an old school typewriter, you would use a tracing page. Or when you were possibly doing a mimeograph, you would trace it. I remember my wife making clothing for our children. She actually made me a shirt, made me a bathrobe one time. She was quite good with that Singer sewing machine. But she always had a pattern. You just don't say, I'm going to start. I'm just going to start uh, making something. You've got to have the pattern to follow. And I remember her laying that pattern out on that fabric, pinning it very carefully, and then cutting along the line. If you get creative and you say, oh, I think I'm going to change it just a little bit, it's not going to fit the same. Unless, of course, you know that since you cut out that pattern, maybe your size has changed and you might need to expand or bring in that pattern. But as we are following Jesus, we must follow Him like that child tracing those letters. As a child was learning the Greek alphabet, the teacher would write the words across the top of the page and they would copy those words very carefully. Remember in first grade, most of us had all across the chalkboard the, the, uh, the letters of the alphabet. And then when we got in third grade, at least when I was in third grade, we started learning cursive. And we had the example right above the board, and none of us never made a Q the way they said to make it. And you, most of us didn't make a K the way that the cursive said. But that was our pattern. We were to duplicate it. It's like a template. And most of us have bought something that we had to hang on the wall. And fortunately, especially with, uh, with uh, towel racks and things like that, we would get a template in the box. And oh, you wouldn't have to guess or do all that measuring. You could get it up there, and now they've got lasers, and you can make things straight. Christ is our pattern. We cannot live like Jesus because He was perfect. But our goal is to copy His pattern. He said, an example, a hupo gramos. But another word we want to look at that's really not in the scripture, but it's the, the concept is his death was efficacious. 
That's not a word that we normally go around using in our sentences. But efficacious means successful in producing the desired or intended result. Effective. Alan, I hope that your knee surgeon had a very good plan that was efficacious. And obviously, you must have done pretty well. You're out here walking around today on two knees that don't even belong to you or didn't originally. But that pattern that that doctor followed, his method was efficacious because it was successful in producing the desired result. Christ's death was, ex was exemplary for us. He was our atonement. 2 Corinthians 5.21 and the application study Bible. And I challenge you all to use study Bibles. You can go to Ollie's and get all kinds of great study Bibles. And of course, I encourage you to go to our local Christian bookstore in Roanoke Rapids. They need the business. They're trying to keep a business going there. But uh, just to tell you, they're cheaper at Ollie's. And you can get all kinds of uh, bi study Bibles. But in the life application study Bible, it's speaks of the propitiation. Now that word is in the Bible. We've studied it before in 1 John. He is our defense attorney. We, he can stand. He, Jesus, stands before God as our mediator because His death satisfied the wrath of God against sin. And He paid the death penalty for our sin. We are forgiven and cleansed. I'd like to read you two of the assignments folks turned in. My assignment was use a sentence with the word efficacious and the word propitiation. Ann Harris said, Jesus Christ became the propitiation of our sins when he bore the weight of the cross. He was efficacious because of the fact that sinners can be forgiven if they believe what he did for them on the cross. And she sent me that. She said, I'm on the top of Buck Mountain as I am writing this. Danny Fig is a man who has who has great, great, great grandfather, uh, knew it Ferguson, buried in that cemetery over here. And we're praying for his mom, Gloria, and also for his dad. They're both going through some challenges. But Danny sent me this message. Jesus' crucifixion on the cross was the propitiation for our sins. His suffering, His blood, and His death at Calvary were an efficacious sacrifice to God to prevent those who accept Christ as their Savior from eternity in hell. I'd like for you this week to try to use the word efficacious in a sentence. It's good for us to learn new words. And the word propitiation you see in your New Testament. You see, sometimes we suffer. And last week I covered this part in 2 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. To, to suffer for our sins, to suffer for our mistakes or our poor judgment is not what he's talking about here. He's talking about suffering for doing right. Suffering for the direct result of our, of our faithful servant to the Lord, not because of our sins. Peter is writing about suffering that comes about from doing good. All you who follow Jesus must be prepared to suffer. We don't know what we're about to face in this country. I'm not reviewing the news. In fact, I watch very little news now because it is so slanted and it is so programmed. I will tell you this, if you go from the three major networks, you're going to hear the same story three times, almost at the very same time. Folks, that is not a coincidence.